communion with each other as a district and to worship God together. And then secondly, we meet on this conference Sunday to give thanks especially for the Reverends Andrew Sterling and Zena Smith, who were yesterday received, of course, into full connection. We want to give tribute to the journey that they've been on as they've navigated these strange and unprecedented times. Ordinarily, of course, this afternoon, they would normally be being ordained. Uh, I'm sure we will all want to mark together the occasion of the Reverend Richard Teal, who was, of course, our previous district chair, becoming president of conference. I was lucky enough to have been mentored by Richard in my two years of probation, and I'm sure you will want to join me and all of us in giving thanks to God for the journey that Richard has been on. So as we are in the presence of God, who journeys and abides with us all, God is with us now, and for that we offer our praise. And we acknowledge God's presence with us in the first song that we're going to sing together, which will be led by Keith and Jill Hudson from Gosforth Methodist Circuit. The hymn is, Be still, for the presence of the Lord, the Holy One, is here. And the words, I hope, are going to come up on your screen. After we've sung, then the Reverend Rachel Williams will lead us in prayer. So let's sing. We come before God in prayer. Let us pray. Our prayers are taken from the welcome service as they fit with the occasion quite well. God of truth, you are worthy of higher praise than we can offer and of purer worship than we can imagine. By your Holy Spirit, assist us in our prayers and draw us to yourself so that what is lacking in our thoughts and actions, in our words and music, may be supplied by your overflowing love through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the silence of this moment, we confess our sins to God. We confess our shortcomings. 
Gracious God, when we do not listen for your word in the words of others, we ask you to forgive and renew us. When we do not use the gifts you have bestowed on us, forgive and renew us. When we do not love one another as sisters and brothers in Christ, forgive and renew us. When we do not serve our neighbours in their need, forgive and renew us. When we do not share the good news with those around us, forgive and renew us. God calls us to serve, forgives us in Christ and renews us by the Holy Spirit. Amen. God of all grace, you call your church to be a holy people, to the praise of your name. In the power of your Holy Spirit, fill our hearts with your love and our lives with your glory. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Thank you, Rachel. We're going to hear two passages of scripture now. First of all, the Reverend Joe Rand is going to read to us from Exodus chapter 3, and then I will share some words from Luke chapter 4. So over to Joe. Exodus chapter 3, verses 1 to 12. Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law Jethro, the priest of Midian. He led his flock beyond the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. There, the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of a bush. He looked, and the bush was blazing, yet it was not consumed. Then Moses said, I must turn aside and look at this great sight and see why the bush is not burned up. When the Lord saw that he had turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. Then he said, come no closer, remove the sandals from your feet for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. He said further, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. Then the Lord said, I have observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I have heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. Indeed, I know their sufferings and I have come down to deliver them from the Egyptians and to bring them up out of that land to a good and broad land, a land flowing with milk and honey to the country of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. The cry of the Israelites has now come to me. I have also seen how the Egyptians oppress them. So come, I will send you to Pharaoh to bring my people, the Israelites, out of Egypt. But Moses said to God, who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the Israelites out of Egypt? He said, I will be with you and this shall be the sign for you that it is I who sent you. When you have brought the people out of Egypt, you shall worship God on this mountain. Amen. Thank you, Joe. And now some words from Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, and I'm reading from verses 16 to 21. When he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, he went to the synagogue on the Sabbath day, as was his custom. He stood up to read, and the scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him. He unrolled the scroll and found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives 
and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. And he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant and sat down. The eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him. Then he began to say to them, today this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. This is the gospel of Christ. Praise to Christ our Lord. Well, it's time for us to sing again now, after which our chair, the Reverend Dr. James Tebbett, is going to share with us. So please join in again as Keith and Jill Hudson lead us in singing together, Spirit of the Living God, fall afresh on me. Thank you. It's really good to see you all uh, this afternoon. It'd be even better to be with you. Uh, I'm missing, as I'm sure many of you are, actually just being together in all the usual ways. Uh, but it's lovely to see faces, so many Methodist friends uh, and some ecumenical colleagues and friends as well. Thank you for being with us, all of you. Um, thank you also to the, um, we, we're still working out its name, whether it's under fives or under tens, but the group of ministers in the district in their early years of ministry who've kindly done the work to put this uh, service together, not least Wendy Thornton in the background, who's having fun with computer buttons that don't always do what we want them to do. And I know many of us experience that, so we're very grateful. Uh, we wanted to gather, as Tim explained, just to be together on this conference Sunday, to honor and celebrate Richard's becoming the president for this year, and to give thanks for and to honor and celebrate that Zena Smith and Andrew Sterling received into full connection. They've completed their probation yesterday and today would have been their ordinations and like again ecumenical colleagues in other churches ordinations this weekend have had to be postponed until such time as we can gather uh, in person and we feel for Andrew and Zena in that not happening in the way expected anticipated in their present waiting but wanting to mark and to celebrate uh, the moment that has been reached and to celebrate their call and their response to call and of course as we all know uh, calling is not something that's unique just to Richard or Andrew or Zena, but it's something that happens to us all. God calls us all and invites us to respond. And our readings, our passages uh, reflect or help us to reflect upon that. Uh, we're so familiar with Exodus chapter three, the burning bush. So much can be said about it, reflected upon it. I'm having to really resist this afternoon because the thing I particularly want to draw attention to is verse seven. We're so um, aware of the story uh, of the phenomenon, wondering what happened, what it must have been like, um, that sometimes we forget the reason or the purpose uh, that is recorded in verse seven, when the Lord said, I've observed the misery of my people who are in Egypt. I've heard their cry on account of their taskmasters. I know their sufferings. 
and I've come down to deliver them, not just to deliver them from, but to deliver them into a, into a land full of milk and honey, a, a, a delivering into flourishing, away from all that constrains and causes suffering, into all that is good. The purpose of the call of Moses, the purpose of any of our calls, is for the greater purpose of relieving suffering uh, and releasing people from oppression and from all that binds them to enable all people uh, to flourish. Um, how appropriate uh, that is, not least at this time. Of course, it's true, the case in every time and generation, but at the time of COVID-19, how we long for release, especially those who suffer most, who are most constrained, how we long for, uh, for black lives truly to matter. The way that this centuries old need, concern, for all human beings to be treated equally has just suddenly sparked off again because of the suffering and the loss of life uh, of more than one individual, how we need to respond. Um, in recent years, the Me Too movement has drawn our attention for the way that power and men especially can abuse others, abuse women. Uh, and lest we forget in the midst of the particular things, the ongoing concern about the environment, which not least the change of global warming, we know has most impact, will have most impact on those who are poorest in the world. For all these reasons, we remember again that God's purpose is to relieve suffering and for there to be human flourishing. The purpose of vocation is not to serve the church, although the church can serve God's purpose. It's not even to worship and praise the Lord, although as we read on, we know that when there has been delivery, there will be a worship on this holy mountain. The outcome, the outworking, will be to worship God, and God delights when we respond to God and worship God and relate to God. But the purpose is the relief of suffering, and that's endorsed when Jesus arrives at Nazareth and chooses the bit from the prophet Isaiah and reads from the scroll to say, the spirit of the Lord is upon me. This is Jesus's manifesto because he's anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Firstly, it starts with God's purpose to relieve suffering, for which, secondly, God calls us. God invites us to be involved, to be a part of it, to be agents for God's purposes, calls us as God called Mo Moses in a particular moment. God calls us sometimes in extraordinary moments, or sometimes just in the ordinary tasks of ordinary days, to each of us, to say to us that sometimes there's a gap here, a need, and you can fill it, even if it doesn't always suit our natural inclinations. Or sometimes because our heart sings with joy at the possibility of helping in one way or another. And one of the things I'm looking forward to is our testimony service, when we'll be hearing from Andrew and Zena. In the ordinary course, we'd have had it during earlier this month, before their ordination. And again, it's postponed. And I'm looking forward to the time when we can have it and gather together and celebrate their story as they share with us how it is in particular that God has worked God's way into their lives and led them to this moment and to this stage. Um, I can think of my own process and one of the questions that uh, Zena and Andrew would have answered at the Presbyteral Synod which would have occurred and had to be cancelled because it was two days after lockdown and, and effectively they said the same answer the same question uh, yesterday when they were received into Bull Connection, one of the questions they're asked is, are you now still as sure of your call as when you first received it? And I know when I was asked that question, I know the answer was supposed to be yes, but in a sense I wanted to say no. And the reason for that was because actually I felt more sure of my call uh, as I went along, as I'd been through training, as I became a probationer minister. But although I say that, and sometimes we can be blessed and more encouraged and confident in our callings, that doesn't mean to say that every day or every week, that's how I feel. Our calling, our response is often made up of many moments and confirmed experience 
and sometimes we're more assured and sometimes we're less sure and this I think is part of the natural experience of it all uh, for all of us. God calls us, God catches us in various ways and then chooses to use us and encounters us and when God encounters us so we find ourselves to be on holy ground. Here I am, said Moses. And he was frightened or afraid or full of awe. And when God encounters us, it is unnerving and sometimes unsettling and occasions us to feel humble and to wonder and not to feel good enough much of the time. Who am I that I should go, said Moses, echoing what many of us feel as we remember how Jesus would call the humble fisherman or the unpopular tax collector, even the collaborator, God through Jesus using them, God using us, great and small, whoever we may be. Who am I that I shall go? Who am I that I shall go to speak to Pharaoh? Said Moses. How anxiety making, fearful that must have been for him. And we have our own pharaohs, people or situations to which we're called to go that is challenging, that are challenging in all sorts of ways. We're so conscious that as part of their probation, Andrew and Zima, Andrew and Zena have been ministers at this time when we've been wrestling with God in love unites us. And such a challenge that has been for us with our different opinions, our different interpretations sometimes of the Bible. And they've been called upon to be ministers, to try and hold all together, to facilitate a good listening, a true listening to one another, as we seek through it all to hear what God may be saying to us. And at this time of COVID-19, it's not straightforward for any of us. And we know that even as we begin to move towards uh, an easing of lockdown, and we wonder about when we might be back together again, we know that this is not a straightforward time. And ministers are called to help us to listen to each other again to discern what it is that God is saying to us uh, and we're all conscious that the new normal may be different from that which we've known before and I think we're becoming increasingly conscious that we may have a relatively short window into work to work thing in which to work things out uh, under the superintendents and ministers zoom meeting this week uh, the reverend trisha rogers uh, serving a candle at present helps us to see that we may have just a very short window in which we can discern what it is that we want to pick up and run with again what we need to let go of what has been new that we want to hold on or what have we yet to discern that involves all of us and it's a challenge for all of us as we seek to respond to God's call at this time. And again, the wider questions remain with us. At the presbyteral session of conference a couple of days ago, uh, we heard from a professor who's also a Methodist minister, Peter Bias, who was again was talking about the environment. And one of the obs observations he was making in terms of our individual and our collective contribution to the carbon footprint as a church is that many of our buildings, being the age that they are, are not efficient to heat. Would we be better for the purposes of the environment, letting go some of our buildings and meeting in a fewer number of them? How challenging that is because we love our chapels with their history and their fellowship. But these are the sort of questions, the sort of pharaohs that we're all facing in being called to respond to God, to relieve suffering for the sake of the world at this time. God calls us to be part of God's, God's purposes. And we so often respond, who on earth am I? And yet God says to us, as God said to Moses, I shall be with you. God has this plan, chooses to use us. Is God really going to abandon us? I don't think so. I think our experience can be as Jesus's experience was in that synagogue all those years ago. The spirit of the Lord is upon me. And so often we discover and are reminded that God is with us through the company of one another, through fellowship, through community. Uh, Moses had Aaron and Miriam and other leaders. 
the whole people of God in the end, for it was the whole people of God who were part of the Exodus, who went towards the promised land. We are in this together. None of us is called to do the whole, and we're accompanied to help one another through. And we're encouraged through the signs along the way, in the way that the sign that God would be with Moses was that they would come and worship God on the holy mountain. So we receive signs as we go along to encourage us. Signs not necessarily of success, because what we're about is not about success or even failure in the world's terms, but signs of whether we are being faithful to God's purpose to relieve suffering and release all those who are in chains. So we are encouraged to trust that God is with us even when we're unsure that it's us who's being called in order for God's purposes to be fulfilled. And I can think of so many examples in recent years, particular people whose names are known to me, whose contexts, whose stories are, I have been privileged to witness or share. The lady who in her early 20s, even her late teens, knew that she was called, felt that she was called to be a local preacher. Yet having some very difficult things happen to her that not least undermined her confidence. Years later, in her late 50s, offering to be a local preacher. And then having to discover again that in the process of training that one couldn't rush on. One had to acquire the knowledge and learn how to craft the sermons and how to grow to be a representative person. All of us, in a sense, are representative people, even if we especially acknowledge that of those who are ordained, representative people of the whole church. But we're all representative people, and that takes a particular gifting to hold others and to act not just for ourselves, but for others. And what a joy it was to watch this lady fulfill her calling that had been there all her life for all her anxiety to be able to do so. I think of a lady who turned up at church one day and we saw her abilities and within three months, you know what we're like as Methodists, we were immediately saying, would you like to be a steward? Or there's this job or that job or the other job we need you to do because we're really struggling. And of course we were a bit premature and she said, no, not for the time being, thank you. But actually with time, we realized what her real gifting was and it was a pastoral gift and a practical gift. She was someone who quietly noticed, who would go and visit the widow with dementia three doors down, who would turn up at someone's funeral who didn't have many people, but she would come and be present. Or I think of another lady, that gift of gently being alongside people, that older lady who would sit with the younger lady who'd lost her daughter just to help her through. Or I could think of the steward who came to me and said they were thinking of resigning because actually they were really nervous when they stood up in front of everybody in church. It's not everybody's comfort zone. It's not everybody's calling. But they were really good at all the other stuff. And indeed, we're quite happy doing that, being in the vestry and some of the practical stuff. And we agreed in the steward's team that it was OK. She didn't need to stand up front. She could do the other jobs. We worked it out together and she could continue what I also believe was her calling to be a steward at that time. Or I think of the person who had a real passion for social justice, especially for the environment. He was able to see things and know things and say things and lead on things far greater than I could possibly do. And I realized, and I said it to him, my job is not to get in your way. My job is to let you lead us in this and to encourage others to listen to you and to see the bright light in his eyes when he spoke and encouraged us uh, to become an eco-church, not as an end in itself, but to get us all to think again about the importance of God's earth and of the environment. All these examples and more that I can name, that you could name, that you know, in those around you, in the church and in the wider community, that you know, thank God, in yourselves, all these examples of those of us all who have answered God's call to be part of God's plan to bring good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives, recovery of sight to the blind, to let the oppressed go free and proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. All who have answered God's call, whom God has and will continue 
to enable and equip, not least by the gift of one another, whom this day especially we want to acknowledge and celebrate and give thanks for as symbols, as examples for the rest of us. Zena and Andrew and Richard, we give God thanks for them. The God who calls you and I, the God who says to us all, I shall be with you. Amen. And so we're going to sing again a hymn that we sang yesterday, a hymn that uh, Richard spoke of, well, his favourite, I think, one of my favourites, a hymn that comes in the ordination service, one of Charles Wesley's, O Thou Who Camest From Above. Jesus, confirm my heart's desire to work and speak and think for thee. Still let me guard the holy fire and still stir up thy gift in me. May that be the prayer for all of us. And we're going to have a time of prayer now as we lift before God the concerns that we have for God's world. Deacon Mel Bevan is going to lead us in prayer and then the Reverend Wendy Thornton and James will say a few words and share some more with us. So thank you Mel. Let us pray. Giver of peace, planter of justice, spirit of love, we lift up to you the world. 
giving thanks for its beauty and majesty, for its many creatures and peoples, for its bounty and flourishing. In our thanksgiving, we also remember those who struggle day in and day out simply to survive, those caught in the midst of conflict and war, those affected by natural disaster, those who are displaced. We remember communities affected by COVID-19 and especially those who lack healthcare provision. May world leaders and politicians prioritize the needs of their countries and communities over profit and short-term gain. Relational God, we lift up to you, your church, giving thanks for its resilience over the past months, the readiness to try new ways of being church and the different ways congregations are reaching out to their communities, trying to point to the blessings and good news in a shaken world. We ask for wisdom and patience as churches are beginning to prepare the return to their buildings. May they grasp the opportunities before them and be courageous in their outlook. Generous God, we lift up to you, your people, giving thanks for the generous gifts you have bestowed on each one of us. We thank you for calling us to follow you and to use our gifts to your glory. In our thanksgiving, we remember those whom you have called to care for others, doctors, nurses, home carers, those whose vocation is to provide other vital services, those who produce our food and empty our bins, the shop assistants and hairdressers, customer service assistants and homemakers. We pray for those who are called to challenge us, comfort us and entertain us with their art, musicers, musicians, painters, poets and artists. Each vocation is valuable and we pray that those called to a particular profession may feel valued and encouraged to use their gifts. Today we pray for those who you have called into the ministry of the church. We pray for the new president of conference, Reverend Richard Thiel, and the vice president, Mrs. Carolyn Lawrence. May they inspire and challenge us throughout the next 12 months and may their ministry be blessed. And we pray especially for Zena and Andrew as they have been received into full connection. Lord, we give you thanks for calling such talented, dedicated and inspiring people to lead your church for their openness, new ideas and prayerful ministry we give thanks. And we thank you for the support Andrew and Zena had from their families and friends and pray that they will be fulfilled in their ministry. And finally, we pray for ourselves and give you thanks for calling us to be your disciples. We hold before you our own needs today. May we be strengthened in our calling and may we support and nurture those who are exploring theirs. We ask these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, the carpenter and fisher of people, the one who calls us to follow him. Amen. And together we pray the Lord's Prayer in the modern version. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. 
give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. So, hi everyone, uh, I'm Wendy. Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to say a couple of words <clears throat> about these two here. Um, as probationer secretary, um, it's, uh, and especially um, as being part of our under 10s peer group, it's been a privilege to be part of Andrew and Zena's journey. They have faced significant challenges with humility, with perseverance and honesty, and not least contending with God in Love Unites Us, uh, flooding and a pandemic all in less than two years. They've undertaken their probation studies and academic studies and fulfilled all that the Methodist Church is required of them. And although learning and growing uh, continues, as with every minister, Andrew and Zena have completed their training. And the conference yesterday affirmed that Andrew and Zena had completed probation and would now enter a new relationship with conference. And so accordingly, the conference received Zena and Andrew into full connection and I watched that and took photographs of my TV as I watched it, celebrating in that moment with them. Um, and the conference resolved that they be ordained at a place and date later to be determined and when that time comes the whole congregation will be invited to declare that they are worthy to be ordained. And whilst Andrew and Zena wait to be ordained, as a district, we want to stand with them and affirm that they are indeed worthy. And James is going to invite us to do that now. Thank you, Wendy. Um, I want everyone to, I want to invite everyone to actually unmute your buttons if you can. Um, so that you can speak and it doesn't matter about the cacophony, the more noise the better on this one. Wendy's going to put up another slide on the screen for us um, in which um, I'm going to um, invite us to respond to affirm that for ourselves we also recognise Zena and Andrew um, to, to be worthy of reception to full connection and when it comes of ordination. I invite all of us to reply in a moment. Do you affirm and trust that by God's grace, Andrew and Zena are worthy to be ordained? They, they are worthy. worthy. Thank you. I can't believe that it's time for our final hymn already, um, which the Rand family are going to lead us in. And then we will close our time together with a blessing. I have to say it's been a real pleasure and a privilege to be part of this time together with you. And I want to thank each of you for being here and for participating. The hymn that we're going to sing is I, the Lord of Sea and Sky. And we sing it as a response for all of us to make before God and each other those things that we've been hearing about this afternoon particularly from James as he was speaking the chorus of the hymn says I will go Lord if you lead me so my invitation is for all of us to make that our prayer as we sing so let's sing the Lord of sea and sky, I have heard my people cry, who dwell in the Lord and say, my hand will stay. Are you made?
So the blessing. May God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. And shall we try unmuting and saying the grace to one another? Grace to our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, the ship of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Back to the team. Tea and coffee now, everyone.